We are continuing with Percy Jackson and the Olympians, book three, which is the Titan's Curse. This is chapter 16. We meet the dragon of eternal bad breath. We'll never make it, Zoe said. We're moving too slow, but we cannot leave the Ophiotaurus. Moo, Bessie said. She swam next to me as we jogged along the waterfront. We left the shopping center, Pierre, far behind. We were heading toward the Golden Gate Bridge, but it was a lot farther than I'd realized. The sun was already dipping in the west. I don't get it, I said. Why do we have to get there at sunset? The Hephaestorides are the nymphs of the sunset, Zoe said. We can only enter their garden as day changes tonight. What happens if we miss it? Tomorrow is winter solstice. If we miss sunset tonight, we would have to wait until tomorrow evening. And by then, the Olympian Council will be over. We must free Lady Artemis tonight. Or Annabeth will be dead, I thought. But I didn't say that. We need a car, Thalia said. But what about Bessie, I asked. Grover stopped in his tracks. I've got an idea. The Ophiotaurus can appear in different bodies of water, right? Well, yeah, I said. I mean... He was in the Long Island Sound. Then he just popped into the water at Hoover Dam. And now he's here. So maybe we could coax him back to Long Island Sound, Grover said. Then Chiron could help us get him to Olympus. But he was following me, I said. If I'm not there, he uh, would he know where he is going? Moo, Bessie said foreignly. I... I can't show him. I can show him, Grover said. I'll go with him. I stared at him. Grover was no fan of the water. He'd almost drowned last summer in the Sea of Monsters, and he couldn't swim very well with, the, with his goat hooves. I'm the only one who can talk to him, Grover said. It makes sense. He bent down and said something in Bessie's ear. Bessie shivered, then made a contented, lowing sound. The blessing of the wild, Grover said. That should help, uh, help with safe passage. Percy, pray to your dad too. See if he'll grant us a safe passage through the seas. I didn't under understand how they could possibly swim back to Long Island from California. Then again, monsters didn't travel the same way as humans. I, I'd seen plenty of evidence of that. I tried to concentrate on the waves, the smell of the ocean, the sound of the tide. Dad, I said, help us. Get the Ophiotaurus and Grover safely to camp. Protect them at sea. A prayer that sounds, uh, a prayer like that needs a sacrifice, Thalia said. Something big. I thought for a second, then I took off my coat. Percy, Grover said, are you sure? That lion skin, that's really helpful. Hercules used it. As soon as he said that, I realized something. I glanced at Zoe who was watching me carefully. I realized I did know who Zoe's hero had been, the one who ruined her life, gotten her kicked out of her family, and never mentioned how she helped him. Hercules, a hero I'd admired all my life. If I'm going to survive, I said, it won't be because I've got a lion skin cloak. I'm not Hercules. I threw the coat into the bay, the coat into the bay, excuse me, it turned back into a golden lion skin, flashing in the light. Then it began to sink beneath the waves. It seemed to dissolve into sunlight on the water. The sea breeze picked up, and Grover took a deep breath. Well, no time to lose. He jumped in the water and immediately began to sink. Bessie gli uh, glided next to him and let Grover take hold of his neck. Be careful, I told him. We will, Grover said. Okay, um, Bessie? How long to, how, how, we're going to Long Island, uh, Long Island. It's east, over that way. Moo, <laughs> Bessie said. Yes, Grover answered. Long Island. It, it, it's the, I, it is, uh, it's this island. And it's long and let's just start. Moo, <laughs> Bessie lurched forward. He started to submerge and Grover said, I can't breathe underwater. I just thought I'd mention that bloop, and under they went. 
and I hope my father's protection would extend to little things like breathing. Well, that's one problem addressed, Zoe said. How can we get into my sister's garden? Dahlia's right, I said. We need a car, but there's nobody to help us here unless we uh, borrowed one. I didn't like that option. I mean, sure, it was a life or death situation, but still, it was stealing. And I wasn't, I was bound, it was bound to get us noticed. Wait, Dahlia said. She started rifling through her backpack. There is somebody in San Francisco who can help us. I've got the address here somewhere. Who? I asked. Dahlia pulled out a crumpled piece of notebook paper and held it up. Professor Chase, Annabeth's dad. After hearing Annabeth gripe about her dad for two years, I was expecting him to have devil horns and fangs. I was not expecting him to be wearing an old-fashioned aviator's cap and goggles. He looked so weird with his eyes bugging out through the glasses that we all took a step back on the front porch. Hello, he said in a friendly voice. Are you delivering my airplanes? Dahlia, Zoe, and I looked at each other warily. Um, no, sir, I said. Trapped, he said. I need more sop with camels. Right, I said, though I had no idea what he was talking about. We're friends of Annabeth. Annabeth? He straightened as if he had, we had just given him an electric shock. Is she all right? Has something happened? None of us answered, but our faces must have told him that something was very wrong. He took off his cap and goggles. He had uh, sandy colored hair like Annabeth and intense brown eyes. He was handsome, I guess, for an older guy, but it looked like he hadn't shaved in a couple of days and his shirt was buttoned wrong. So one of us, uh, so one side of his collar stuck up higher than the other side. You better come in, he said. It didn't look like a house they just moved into. There were Lego robots on the stairs and two cats sleeping on the sofa in the living room. The coffee table was stacked with magazines and a little kid's winter coat was spread on the floor. The whole house smelled like fresh baked chocolate chip cookies and there was jazz music coming from the kitchen. It seemed like a messy, happy kind of, kind of home. The kind of place that had been lived in forever. Dad, a little boy screamed. He was, he's taking apart my robots. Bobby, Dr. Chase said, called absently. Don't take apart your brother's robots. I'm Bobby, the little boy protested. He's Matthew. Matthew, Dr. Chase called. Don't take apart your brother, your brother's robots. Okay, dad. Dr. Chase turned to us. I'll go, we'll go upstairs to my study this way. Honey, a woman called. Annabeth's stepmom appeared in the uh, living room, wiping her hands on a dish towel. She was a pretty Asian woman with red highlighted hair tied in a bun. Who are your guests? Who are our guests? She asked. Oh, Dr. Chase said, this is, he stared at us blank blankly. Frederick, she chided, you forgot to ask them their names? We introduced ourselves a little uneasily, but Mrs. Chase seemed very, really nice. She asked if we were hungry. We admitted we were, and she told us she'd bring us some cookies and sandwiches and sodas. Dear, Dr. Chase said, they came about Annabeth. I half expected Mrs. Chase to turn into a raving lunatic at the mention of her stepdaughter, but she just paw, uh, pursed her lips and looked concerned. All right, go up to the study, and I'll bring you some food. She smiled at me. Nice meeting you, Percy. I've heard a lot about you. Upstairs, we talked about doc, we walked into Dr. Chase's study and I said, whoa, the room was wall to wall books, but what really caught my attention were the war toys. There was a huge table with miniature tanks and soldiers fighting along a blue painted river with hills and fake trees and stuff. Old fashioned biplanes hung from strings on the ceiling, tilted at uh, crazy angles like they were in the middle of a dogfight. Dr. Chase smiled. Yes, the third battle of Yepris. I'm writing a paper, you see, on the use of Sopwith camels to strife animal, enemy lines. I believe they played a much greater role than they've been given credit for. He plucked a biplane from its string and swept it across the battlefield, making airplane engine noises. 
as he knocked down little German soldiers. Oh, right, I said. I knew Annabeth's dad was a professor of military history. She never mentioned he played with toy soldiers. Zoe came over and studied the battlefield. The German lines were farther from the river. Dr. Chase stared at her. How do you know that? I was there, she said, matter of factly. Artemis wanted, us, wanted to show us how horrible war was, the way mortal men fight each other, and how foolish, too. The battle was a complete waste. Dr. Chase opened his mouth in shock. You, she's a hunter, sir, but that's not why we're here. We need, you saw the Sopwith camels, Dr. Chase said. How many were there? What formations did they fly? Sir, Folia broke in. Annabeth is in danger. That got his attention. He set the biplane down. Of course, he said, tell me everything. It wasn't easy, but we tried. Meanwhile, the afternoon light was fading outside and we were running out of time. When we finished, Dr. Chase collapsed in the leather recliner. He laced his hands. My poor brave Annabeth, we must hurry. Sir, we need transportation to Mount Olympias, Zoe said, and we need it immediately. I'll drive you. Um, it'd be faster to fly in my camel, but it only seats two. Whoa. You have an actual biplane, I said. Down at Chrissy Field, Dr. Chase said proudly. That's a reason I had to move here. My sponsor is a private collector with some of the fine, finest World War I relics in the world. He let me restore the sop with camel. Sir, Thalia said, just a car would be great. And it might be better if we went without you. It's too dangerous. Dr. Chase frowned uncomfortably. Now, wait a minute, young lady. Annabeth is my daughter. Dangerous or not? I can't just snacks, Mrs. Chase announced. She pushed through the door with a full tray of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, Cokes and cookies fresh out of the oven. The chocolate chips still gooey. Dahlia and I inhaled a few cookies while Zoe said, I can drive, sir. I am not as young as I look. I promise not to destroy your car. Mrs. Chase knit her eyebrows. What is this about? Annabeth is in danger, Dr. Chase said. On Mount Tam, I would drive them but apparently it's no place for mortals. It sounded like it was really hard for him to get past that last part out. To get that last part out. I waited for Mrs. Chase to say no. I mean, what mortal parent would allow three underage teenagers to borrow their car? To my surprise, Mrs. Chase nodded. Then they better get going. Right. Dr. Chase jumped up and started patting his pockets. My keys. My wife's side. His wife sighed. Frederick. Honestly, you lose your head if they weren't wrapped inside your aviator hat. The keys are hanging on the peg by the front door. Right, Dr. Chase said. Zoe grabbed a sandwich. Thank you both. We should go now. We hustled out the door and down the stairs. The chase is right behind us. Percy, Mrs. Chase called as I was leaving. Tell Annabeth. Tell her she still has a home to come here. Uh, she still has a home here. Will you remind her of that? I took one last look at the messy living room. Annabeth's half-brother spilling Legos and arguing. The smell of cookies filling the air. Not a bad place, I thought. I'll tell her, I promised. We ran out of uh, the yellow VW convertible, parked on the driveway. The sun was going down. I figured we had less than an hour to save Annabeth. Can't this thing go any faster? Dahlia demanded. Zoe glared at her. I cannot control traffic. You both sound like my mother, I said. Shut up, they said in unison. Zoe waved in and out of traffic on the Golden Gate Bridge. The sun was sinking on the horizon. We finally got into Marin County and exited the highway. The roads were insanely narrow, winding through forests and up the sides of hills and around the edges in steep eight ravines. Zoe didn't slow down at all. Why does everything smell like cough drops, I asked. Eucalyptus, Zoe pointed to the huge trees all around us. The stuffed koala bears eat? And monsters, she said. They love chewing the leaves, especially dragons. Dragons chew eucalyptus leaves? Believe me, Zoe said. If you had, a dra if you had dragon breath, you would choose chew eucalyptus too. I didn't, I didn't question her. But I did keep my eyes peeled more closely as we drove. Ahead of us loomed Mount Talampius. 
I guess, in terms of mountains. It was a small one, but it looked pretty huge as we were driving toward it. So the mountain of despair, I asked. Yes, Zoe said tightly. Why do they call it that? She was silent for almost a mile before answering. After the war, between the Titans and the gods, many of the Titans were punished and imprisoned. Kronos was sliced to pieces and thrown into Tartarus. Kronos's right-hand man, the general of his forces, was imprisoned up there, up there on the summit and just beyond the garden of the Hephaestorides. The general, I said, uh, clouds seemed to be swirling around its peak as though the mountains were drawing them in, spinning them like a top. What's going on up there, a storm? Zoe didn't answer. I got the feeling she knew exactly what the clouds meant and she didn't like it. We have to concentrate, Thalia said. The mist is really strong here. The magical kind or the natural kind, I asked. Both. The gray clouds swirled even thicker on the mountain. And, they, they, and we kept driving straight toward them. We were out of the forest now into wide open spaces of cliffs and grass and rocks and fog. I, and I happened to glance down at the ocean as we passed a scenic curve and I saw something that made me jump out of my seat. Look, and we turned, toward, uh, turned a corner and the ocean disappeared behind the hills. What, Dahlia asked. A big white ship, I said, docked near the beach. It looked like a cruise ship. Her eyes widened. Luke's ship? I wanted to say I wasn't sure, but um, being uh, it might be a coincidence, but I knew better. The Princess Andromeda. Luke's demon cruise ship was docked at the beach, and that's why he'd sent all his, his that's why he'd sent his ship all the way down to the Panama Canal. It was the only way to sail it from the East Coast to California. We will have the uh, we will have company then, Zoe said grimly. Kronos's army. I was about to answer when suddenly the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Dahlia shouted, stop the car now. Zoe must have sensed something was wrong because she slammed on the brakes without question. The yellow VW spun twice before coming to a stop at the edge of the cliff. Out, Dahlia opened the door and pushed me hard. We both rolled out onto the pavement. The next second, boom, lightning flashed and Dr. Chase's Volkswagen erupted like a yellow canary grenade. I probably would have been killed by shrapnel except for Thalia's shield, which appeared over me. I heard a sound like metal rain, and when I opened my eyes, we were surrounded by wreckage. Part of the VW Spender was impaled itself in the street. The smoking hood was spinning in circles. Pieces of yellow metal were strewn across the road. I swallowed, uh, I, I swallowed the taste of smoke out of my mouth and looked at Thalia. You saved my life. One shall perish by a parent's hand, she muttered. Curse him. He would destroy me? Me? It took me a second to realize she, uh, what uh, she was talking about her dad. Oh, hey, he couldn't have been, it couldn't have been Zeus's lightning bolt. No way. Then who's then? Thalia demanded. I don't know. Zoe said Kronos, maybe, uh, Kronos' name, maybe he, Dahlia shook her head, looking angry and stunned. No, that wasn't it. Wait, I said, where's Zoe? Zoe! We both ran up and got, and we both got up and ran around the blasted VW, nothing inside, nothing in either direction of the road. I looked down the cliff, no sign of her. Zoe! I shouted. Then she was, uh, then she was standing right next to me pulling uh, me by my arm. Silence, fool. Would you wait? Uh, do you want to wake Landon? Where, uh, you mean we're here? Very close, she said. Follow me. Sheets of fog were drifting right across the road. Zoe stepped into one of them. And when the fog passed, she was no longer there. Dahlia and I looked at each other. Concentrate on Zoe, Dahlia advised. We're following her. Go straight into the fog. Keep that in mind. Wait, Thalia, about what happened back on the pier. I mean, with the manacore and the sacrifice, I don't want to talk about it. You wouldn't actually have, you know, she hesitated. I was just shocked. That's all. Zeus didn't send the lightning bolt to the car. It was Kronos. 
He's trying to manipulate you, make you angry at your dad. She took a deep breath. Percy, you know, I, I know you're trying to make me feel better. Thanks. But come on, we need to go. She stepped uh, into the fog, into the mist, and I followed. When the fog cleared, I was still on the side of the mountain. But the road was dirt. The grass was thicker. The sunset made a blood red slash across the sea. The summit of the mountain seemed closer now, swirling with storm clouds and raw power. There was only one path to the top directly in front of us, and it led through a lush meadow of shadows and flowers, the garden of twilight, just like I'd seen in my dream. If it hadn't been for that enormous dragon, the garden would have been the most beautiful place I'd ever seen. The grass shimmered with silvery evening light, and the flowers with such, were such brilliant colors, they almost glowed in the dark. Stepping stones of polished black marble led around either side of, the, of a five-story tall apple tree, both uh, every bough glittering with golden apples. And I don't mean yellow golden apples like, the, like in the grocery store. I mean real golden apples. I can't describe why they were so appealing, but as soon as I smelled their fragrance, I knew that one bite would almost be the most delicious thing, would be the most delicious thing I'd ever tasted. The apples of immortality, Thalia said. Hera's wedding gift from Zeus. I wanted to step right up and pluck one, pluck one, except for the dragon coiled around the tree. Now, I don't know what you think, uh, when, uh, think of when I say dragon. Whatever it is, it's not scary enough. The serpent's body was as thick as a booster rocket, glinting with coppery scales. He had more heads than I could count as if a hundred deadly poison, uh, deadly pythons had been fused together. Like uh, he appeared to be asleep. The heads lay curled in a big spaghetti-like mound on the, on the grass, all the eyes closed. Then the shadows in front of us began to move. There was a beautiful eerie singing like voices from the bottom of a well. I reached the reach for Riptide, but Zoe stopped my hand. Four figures shimmered into existence. Four young women who looked very much like Zoe. They all wore white Greek chitons. Their skin was uh, caramel. Silky black hair tumbled loose around their shoulders. It was strange, but I never realized how beautiful Zoe was until I saw her siblings, the Hephaestorids. They looked just like Zoe, gorgeous and probably very dangerous. Sisters, Zoe said. We do not see any sister, one of the girls said coldly. We see two half-bloods and a hunter, all of whom shall soon die. You've got it wrong, I stepped forward. Nobody is going to die. The girls studied me. They had eyes like volcanic rock, glassy and completely black. Perseus Jackson, one of them said. Yes, mused another. I do not see why he is a threat. Who said I was a threat? The first Hephaestorid glid, uh, glanced behind her toward the top of the mountain. They fear thee. They are unhappy that this one has not yet killed thee. She pointed to Thalia. Tempting sometimes, Thalia admitted, but no, thanks. He's my friend. There are no friends here, daughter of Zeus, the girl said. Only enemies go back. Not without, Thalia, not without Annabeth, Thalia said. And Artemis, Zoe said. We must approach the mountain. You, will, uh, you know he will kill thee, the girl said. You are no match for him. Artemis must be freed, Zoe insisted. Let us pass. The girl shook her head. You have no rights here anymore. We have only to raise our voices and Landon will wake. He will not hurt me, Zoe said. No. And what about thy so-called friends? When then Zoe did the last thing I expected, she shouted, Landon, wake! The dragon stared, glittered like a mountain of pennies. You, uh, the Hephaestorides yelped and scattered. The girl led, uh, the girl, the lead girl said to Zoe, you are mad. 
You never had any courage, sister, Zoe said. That is thy problem. The dragon, Landon, was writhing now, a hundred heads whipping around, tongues flickering and tasting the air. Zoe took a step forward, her arms raised. Zoe, don't, Thalia said. You're not a Hephaestorid anymore. He'll kill you. Landon is trained to protect the tree, Zoe said. Skirt around the edges of the garden. Go up the mountain. As long as I am a bigger threat, he should ignore thee. Should, I said. Not exactly reassuring. It's the only way, she said. Even the three of us together cannot fight him. Landon opened his mouth. The sound of hundred heads hissing at once sent a shiver down my back. And that was before he was breathing. His breath hit me. The smell was like acid. It made my eyes burn, my skin crawl, and my hair stand on end. I remembered the time a rat had died inside our apartment wall in New York in the middle of the summer. This stench was like that, except a hundred times stronger and mixed with the smell of chewed eucalyptus. I promised myself right then and there, right then, that I would never ask a school nurse for another cough drop. I wanted to draw my sword, but then I remembered my dream of Zoe and Hercules and how Hercules had failed in a head-on assault. I decided to trust Zoe's judgment. Thalia went left. I went right. Zoe walked straight toward the monster. It's me, my little dragon, Zoe said. Zoe has come back. Landon shifted forward, then back. Some of the mouths closed. Some kept hissing. Dragon confusion. Meanwhile, the Hephaestorates uh, shimmered and turned into shadows. Shadows. The voices, uh, the voice of the eldest whispered, "Fool." I used to free uh, feed thee by hand, Zoe continued, speaking in a soothing voice as she stepped toward the golden tree. Do you still like uh, lamb's meat? The dragon's eyes glint glinted. Thalia and I were about halfway around the garden. Ahead, I could see a single rocky trail leading up the black peak of the mountain. The storm swirled above it, spinning in a uh, on the summit like it was the axis for the whole world. We'd almost made it out of the uh, meadow when something went wrong. I felt the dragon's mood shift. Maybe Zoe got too close. Maybe the dragon realized he was hungry. Whatever the reason, he lunged at Zoe. 2,000 years of training kept her alive. She, uh, she dodged one set of slashing fangs, tumbled under another, weaving through the uh, dragon's heads as she ran in our direction gagging from the monster's horrible breath. I drew Riptide to help. No, Zoe panted, run! The dragon snapped at her side and Zoe cried out. Thalia uncovered Aegis uh, and the dragon hissed. In this his moment of indecision, Zoe sprinted, us, sprinted past us up the mountain and we followed. The dragon did not try to pursue. He hissed and stomped the ground, but I guess he was well-trained to guard that tree. He wasn't going to be lured off, even by the tasty prospect of eating some heroes. We ran up the mountain as the Hephaestorides resumed their song in the shadows behind us. The music didn't sound so beautiful to me now, more like the sound uh, track for a funeral. At the top of, a, of the mountain were ruins, blocks of black granite and marble as big as houses, broken columns, statues of bronze, that looked as though they'd been half melted. The ruins of Mount Arthias, Thalia whispered in awe. Yes, Zoe said. It was, it was not here before. This is bad. What is Mar uh, Mount Arthias, I asked, feeling like a fool as usual. The mountain fortress of the Titans, Zoe said. In the first war, Mount Olympus and Arthias were the two rival capitals of the world. Orpheus was, she winced at her sight. You're hurt, I said. Let me see. No, it is nothing. I was saying, in the first war, Orpheus was blasted to pieces. But how is it here? Thalia looked around cautiously as we picked our way through the rubble, past blocks of marble and broken archways. It moves in the same way the Olympus, that Olympus moves. It always exists in the edges of civilization. But the fact that it is here 
on this mountain is not good. Why? This is Atlas's mountain, Zoe said, where he holds, she froze. Her voice was ragged with despair, where he used to hold up the sky. We had reached the summit. A few yards ahead of us, gray clouds swirled in a heavy vortex, making a funnel cloud that almost touched the mountaintop, instead of a rest, uh, but instead rested on the shoulders of a 12-year-old girl with auburn hair and a tattered silvery dress, Artemis, her legs bound to the rock with celestial bronze chains. chains. This is what I had seen in my dream. It hadn't been a cavern roof that Artemis was forced to hold up. It was the roof of the world. Milady, Zoe rushed forward, and but Artemis said, stop, it is a trap. You must leave now. Her voice was strained. She was drenched in sweat. I had never seen a goddess in pain before, but the weight of the sky was clearly too much for Artemis. Zoe was crying. She ran forward despite Artemis' protest and uh, tugged at the chains. A booming voice behind us uh, spoke behind us. Ah, oh, how touchy. We turned. The general was standing there in his brown silk suit. At his side were Luke and half a dozen drachne bearing the golden sarcophagus of Kronos. Anubis stood at Luke's side. She had her hands cuffed behind her back, a gag in her mouth, and Luke was holding the point of a sword at her throat. Thalia looked around cautiously as we picked our way through the rubble, past blocks of marble and broken archways. It moves in the same way uh, that Olympus moves. It always exists in the edges of civilization, but as the fact, the fact that it is here on this mountain is not good. Why? This is Atlas's mountain, Zoe said, where he holds, she froze. Her voice was ragged with despair, where he used to hold up the sky. We, reached the, we had reached the summit a few yards ahead of us. Gray clouds swirled in, heavy, in a heavy vortex, making a funnel cloud that almost touched the mountaintop, but instead rested on the shoulders of a 12-year-old girl with auburn hair and a tattered silvery dress. Artemis, her legs bound to the rock with celestial bronze chains. This is what I had seen in my dream. It hadn't been a cavern roof that Artemis was forced to hold. It was the roof of the world. Milady, Zoe rushed forward, but Artemis said, stop, it is a trap. You must leave now. Her voice was strained. She was drenched in sweat. I had never seen a goddess in pain before, but the weight of the sky was clearly too much for Artemis. Zoe was crying. She ran forward despite Artemis' protest and tugged at the chains. A booming voice spoke behind us. Ah, ouch touchy. We turned. The general was standing there in a brown, brown silk suit. At his side were Luke and half a dozen Dracne bearing the golden sarcophagus of Kronos. Annabeth stood at Luke's side. She had her hands cuffed behind her back, a gag in her mouth, and Luke was holding the point of his sword to her throat. I met her eyes, trying to ask her a thousand questions. There was just one message she was sending me, though. Run. Luke, Thalia snarled. Let her go. Luke's smile was weak and pale. He looked even worse than he had three days ago in D.C. That's the general's decision, Thalia. But it's good to see you again. Thalia spat at him. The general chuckled. <laughs> so much for old friends. And you, Zoe, it's been a long time. How is my little traitor? I will enjoy killing you. Do not respond, Artemis groaned. Do not challenge him. Wait a second, I said. You're Atlas? The general glanced at me. So, even the stupidest of heroes can finally figure something out. <laughs> yes, I am Atlas, the general of the Titans and terror of the gods. Congratulations. I will kill you presently, as soon as I deal with this wretched girl. You're not going to hurt Zoe, I said. I won't let you, the general sneered. <laughs> you have no right to interfere, little hero. This is a family matter. I frowned. A family matter? 
Yes, Zoe said bleakly. Atlas is my father.